Hello, hello, I'm Rex Astoria, and this is going to be the incredible story of Witold Pilecki. Pilecki was a Polish cavalry officer, and then he became a resistance leader who volunteered himself to go into Auschwitz, and then after that, he became a spy, and now he is revered as a Polish war hero. It's an unbelievable story, and I just, I gotta tell you guys. Pilecki was born in Karelia in the Russian Empire and moved to Vilno when he was nine years old. He joined a Polish Boy Scouts organization, and they were really pro-Poland independence, and they often talked about that and fought for that. While growing up, Pilecki loved military games, art, and poetry, and music, which is an interesting combination. When World War I broke out, his mother sent him to Orel to live with his aunt. While he was in Orel, he established the local chapter of the Polish Boy Scouts that he was a part of when he was younger. In Pilecki's first ever combat mission, he and a bunch of his friends raid a Russian armory and steal a bunch of guns, equipment, and ammo. In December of 1918, so right after World War I ends, he enlists himself into the Lithuanian self-defense militia, and he is tasked with fighting communists that are trying to take over Lithuania. And more specifically, his job is to defend something called the Gates of Dawn, which is like the most badass thing ever. <laughs> However, Vilno, or Vilnius, depending on who's controlling at the time, fell to the communists, so he had to kind of retreat. After this, he kind of bounced around different Polish scouts organizations and different military units and fought in the Polish-Soviet War. After that, he participated in the Polish-Lithuanian War, and was part of Zeligowski's mutiny. During this war, he and his comrades stormed a Bolshevik-held machine gun nest, and they captured 80 Bolsheviks. After this, he was demobilized and put into the reserves. During the interwar period, he tried to get an education, but he couldn't afford it, so that kind of fell through. He was a member of the National Security Union, and he went to school to become an NCO. He continued to climb the ranks and bounced around a bunch of different units, but eventually he just settled down in his old family's farm. Interestingly enough, his neighbor was the commander-in-chief of the Polish armed forces, Edward Rydz Schmigler, and he actually became friends with him, which is pretty cool. He married his wife, Maria Ostrowka, and he had two kids, Andrzej and Zofia, and both of his kids are still alive today, and I'll talk about them later, they're very interesting. He ran a large farm with his family and was heavily involved in different Polish defense and intelligence circles all the way up until World War II started. He was immediately mobilized and went into battle and his unit was immediately smashed. So he went to Warsaw after his unit was eviscerated, got reorganized into another unit, went into combat, and it got obliterated again. After his unit got eviscerated for the second time, he became a partisan and established the Tania Armia Polska, or the TAP. The TAP was a resistance organization that eventually grew to 20,000 members, and then it merged with the Home Army. Major Jan Voldarkowicz, who was the, the head of the TAP, he called a meeting and he said that someone should infiltrate Auschwitz to gather information about the atrocities that they, they knew something was going on there. So they wanted to send someone in there to get documentation of the atrocities and send it to the Allies, and hopefully that would inform the Allies and they would try to liberate. Now this plan is crazy. It involves someone going voluntarily into Auschwitz, but Pilecki volunteered. So on September 19th, 1940, he intentionally got caught in a Polish street roundup and was sent to Auschwitz. I should mention that it wasn't necessarily certain that he was going to go to Auschwitz, as he could have gone to really any of the forced labor camps in Germany, but yes, he did go to Auschwitz. It is reported that he said to his wife, because he had a wife and kids at this time, that report that I fulfilled the order just before he got captured. He was put in a cattle car, and when he arrived at Auschwitz, quote, all those picked up were already showing signs of crowd psychology. The result being that our whole crowd behaved like a herd of passive sheep. Quote, a simple thought kept nagging me. Stir up everyone and get this mass of people moving. He used the identity of a man named Tomasz Serafinski, who Pilecki believed was a fallen Polish fighter, and so he used his identity. Shortly after arriving at Auschwitz, Pilecki was injected, inspected, infected. His head was shaven, and he was given a set of very thin striped clothing. And one of his first experiences in Auschwitz was getting his two front teeth knocked out. It is reported that he was really well liked in Auschwitz by the other Polish inmates, but to the guards that didn't matter. 
He was only known as inmate 4859. 4859 was considered an unlucky number because the two end and the two middle numbers both add up to 13. Capos descended on the new Auschwitz arrivals and beat them mercilessly and even killed a few. He describes how there were German Shepherd dogs trained specifically to go for the neck. And a capo, by the way, is a concentration camp inmate who is convicted for a violent crime and he is tasked with keeping the other prisoners in line. So he works very closely with the guards and he has the authority to beat up people. Very vicious, horrible people. And now, of course, I have to describe the conditions of Auschwitz. Now, the conditions of Auschwitz were more horrifyingly evil than anything the devil could dream of. There were often four people to a small, tiny bunk, and it wasn't uncommon for you to wake up and the person next to you was just dead. Disease was rampant through the camps. There were rats everywhere, cockroaches everywhere, lice everywhere. It was a horrible, horrible place. You were never fed enough. You were never given enough water or food. Guards would constantly beat random people for doing nothing. It was a horrible, horrible place to live. And of course, you were always working really hard, laborious jobs with no rest, no breaks for hours and days on end. It was meant to kill you from exhaustion. Punishments were totally random, you know, it could be for anything, looking at a guard wrong, or it could be for anything, and you could be beaten or shot for any reason. And if you were ever found out to be something like a doctor or a scientist or any other member of the intelligentsia, you were immediately killed. It was part of a Nazi program to kill all of the Polish intelligentsia. It was so bad in Auschwitz that people jumped into the electric barbed wire just to kill themselves. Now, Pilecki was in great shape. Of course, he was a military man. He was in, he was in amazing physical shape, and he spent basically his entire life learning how to survive. So he lasted a lot longer than people in Auschwitz. And because he was so physically fit, he had enough time to learn how the camp operated so he would give himself the best chance of survival, and that snowballed into him being able to survive for a very long time. Now, immediately, Pileski set on his mission to establish a resistance within the camp. That was one of the main reasons why he was sent to Auschwitz in the first place. He wanted to set up small, five-man resistance cells within Auschwitz, and these five-man resistance cells would help each other survive, and eventually they would rise up all together and overtake the camp. That was that was Pilecki's end goal, was have these as many five-group cells as possible. They would all rise up at once, and they would take over the camp. Before that, though, these resistance cells were meant to boost each other's morale and give each other extra food or clothes if they needed it. Another big reason why he was in the camp in the first place was he needed to gather intelligence about Auschwitz and report it back to the Allies. So he got any paper he could find, any writing utensil he could find, and wrote reports that he would smuggle out to the Polish underground home army. And then once the Polish home army got these reports, they would compile them and send them to the Polish government in exile, who would forward them to the British government. And then once the British government would have them, they could figure out what to do, like send supplies into Poland or, li or send paratroopers to liberate Auschwitz. That was their end goal. Polecki for a long time really believed that the British military or Polish government in exile forces could paradrop weapons into Auschwitz. The camp could liberate itself, and of course it wouldn't be able to survive very long, but at least they would be useful instead of just dying there. Bolesky set up the ZOW, or in English, the Union of Military Organization. And what's interesting about these five-man cells is no five-man cell knew of another five-man cell's existence. So that way, if one five-man cell was detected, they might be caught but it wouldn't jeopardize the rest of the organization. By March of 1942, it is estimated that he had 500 members in the ZOW, which is 100 five-man resistance cells, which is pretty damn impressive. Boletsky said, quote, Camp was a proving ground of character. Some slithered into a moral swamp. Others chiseled themselves a character of finest crystal. 
And eventually the organization was expanded to include non-Polish concentration camp inmates. And this organization was able to make small life improvements in Auschwitz, just make it a little more bearable for the inmates of Auschwitz. Now, Auschwitz changed a lot while Pilecki was in there. First, he smuggled his intel reports out of people who were leaving the prison. Essentially, in the early days of Auschwitz, you could pay to leave Auschwitz, but eventually this stopped happening. So, Pilecki had to find other ways to smuggle out his documents. And now, I know people are going to use this fact in bad faith to portray Auschwitz as a better thing than it was in real life. People use the fact that Auschwitz had a soccer team to portray Auschwitz as not that bad. It's wrong and it's in bad faith. Horrible, horrible things happen at Auschwitz. And just because it did have a soccer team on paper doesn't mean that it was some, you know, day camp. Likewise, people could pay to have their family members released from Auschwitz. Doesn't mean it was a good place. In fact, you know, family had paid money to release them from Auschwitz. They'd be held in quarantine for a few weeks while they physically recovered so that they didn't come back into society looking like Auschwitz victim. So like it was a horrible, horrible place. And don't use those facts to justify something that was horrible. Pilecki also detailed in his reports the first use of Zyklon B and detailed how he saw the first gas chambers being built at Auschwitz. Specifically, he detailed how Auschwitz transformed into a industrialized killing machine that was determined to get every ounce of labor out of its prisoners. For instance, at the start of Auschwitz, prisoners would be tasked with moving big rocks from one side of a field to another side of a field. But now Auschwitz transformed into a factory where prisoners would have to, you know, make ammunition or guns and stuff like that. This happened in and around 1941, 1942, which coincidentally was when the, the tide of the war really started shifting against Germany. So Himmler, who is in charge of the concentration camps, sees that the war is not such a foregone conclusion anymore and decides that he needs to he needs to change the concentration camps into making them factories. And Pilecki himself saw the first Red Army prisoners of war being walked into the crematorium. Pilecki would use any of the power or influence he had to get his five-man cells out of forced labor, where they would surely die, and try to get them into slightly better jobs like be working in the post office or the bakery or laundry so that they had a better chance of surviving. Originally, there were group punishments if someone tried to escape, so Pilecki urged no one to escape. However, once the SS started industrializing these camps, group punishments would just lead to less productivity in the factories, so this policy was changed. So now Pilecki started helping people escape. And so Pilecki had a perfect opportunity to escape, but he chose not to and gave it to another prisoner who escaped through a sewer. Pilecki had the perfect opportunity to escape from Auschwitz, and he chose not to. The, I, it doesn't even comprehend in my brain how selfless this movement. He's deliberately prolonging his time in Auschwitz so another person who is in more grave danger can escape. It just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But I guess that was just the kind of person that Pilecki was. Pilecki and other members of the DOW was actually able to make a radio in Auschwitz with spare parts, but eventually they had to kind of nix that operation because having a radio in Auschwitz was not a great idea. Pilecki ended up being so well liked that, quote, among the Poles in the concentration camp, there were many that believed that Poland's freedom would have to come from him. And they did everything in their power to make sure that he made it through alive. And now I've definitely described Pilecki as this sort of like Superman, Iron Man, like, and, and he was, he definitely was. And this is what really proves it. In Auschwitz, of course, he was getting increasingly depressed because every day he kept asking for the allies to do something. The allies just drop in a crate of weapons, drop in just a hundred paratroopers, and we could liberate this, we could liberate Auschwitz. Temporarily, sure, but at least we could do it. But as the British and Polish government in exile, they just couldn't do anything or chose not to, he became increasingly depressed. But this is Witzel Pilecki, so he never let it show that he was feeling sad 
and he never, ever, ever spoke to Fetus because he knew that if he started to speak to Fetus, the entire ZOW would just crumble, and that would be the worst. So Paletsky is just the pinnacle of stoicism. He told himself, you're not giving up yet, every single day for years. And so let's talk about Paletsky's messages. Paletsky would write a report in Auschwitz. He would then send it out of the camp through a bunch of different means. And this message would reach the Polish home army that is in Poland. Then couriers from the Polish home army would go to Danzig. Then from Danzig, they would go to Stockholm. And then from Stockholm, they would go to London. And then in London, they would deliver it to the British, or they would deliver it to the Polish government in exile, who would then deliver it to the British. And the Polish government in exile, and the British, I guess, sent it to everyone. Everyone knew that there was a Holocaust going on in Europe. They knew, and they didn't do anything about it. Pilecki was one of the first people to identify the Nazi strategy or their, their propaganda strategy. The propaganda strategy of the Nazis was to divide the Polish people against each other to make them easier targets. There was a core problem in the Polish resistance, and that was there was a ton of resistance. There were Jewish resistance movements, there were Catholic resistance movements, there were primarily like Polish resistance movements. And then if the Polish resistance ever needed to collaborate with the Czech resistance for something, there's just no way of doing that. Pre-war political parties had founded their own resistance movements. So there was fascist, very pro, very nationalist Polish resistance movements. And then there were communist resistance movements and democratic and all of this stuff. And they were just not working together. Pilecki sought to eliminate this divide within the different resistance organizations of Poland. Pilecki's first message was sent out of the camp via Alexander Wipolski. And the message basically said, bomb Auschwitz. Just from the air, bomb everything because at least our deaths would be merciful. And the Allies kept getting progressively more and more dire messages from Pilecki. And again, they just refused to lift a finger. But eventually Pilecki knew that he had to escape. So he got a job with two other inmates, Jan Redej and Eduard Sizilski. They were tasked with repairing an oven at a camp bakery outside of Auschwitz. And so for the first time in a very long time, he was outside of Auschwitz. Of course, he was still a prisoner, but he was like outside of the barbed wire of Auschwitz. And he saw people just having conversations, normal conversations, and, and children playing in the field. And this really fucked with them mentally. Like this messed him up because he sees Auschwitz and then children playing in a field. But of course, if he was feeling sad, he never showed it. And he just kept saying, you're not giving up yet. At midnight, April 27th, 1943, him and the other two inmates broke through a heavy metal door and overpowered a guard. He then cut the phone lines and the alarm lines and using documents and SS uniforms that they had stolen, escaped the camp perimeter. A patrol had fired rounds at them and some even went through his clothes, his very thin concentration camp clothes, but never actually ended up hitting him. And now this might be one of the most incredible feats of athleticism I've ever heard of. He ran 100 kilometers or 60 miles in over the course of a week, running from other people with guns, well he didn't have a gun, through a forest after not eating a solid meal for years. He eventually found a safe house that was ran by the Armia Krajor, aka Home Army. After 2,500 roll calls and 947 days in Auschwitz, he was finally free. Kind of. Now there's an interesting detail about this safe house. It was actually owned by none other than Tomasz Serafinski. So yeah, the person who Pilecki used his identity wasn't actually dead, and he ended up at his safe house. Of all the safe houses he could have gone to, he ended up at his safe house. <laughs> Unfortunately, this did have some unfortunate implications for Tomasz Serafinski because on Christmas Day he was arrested for having escaped Auschwitz. But of course, he didn't ever go to Auschwitz, only Pilecki did. So there was a confusion at the jail and the Gestapo was interrogating him and everyone was thoroughly confused. But eventually, three weeks later, he was released because he hadn't escaped Auschwitz. And what is especially heartwarming is that Pilecki's son, Andrzej, still has friendly relations with the 
Serafinsky family. And then after recuperating in that safe house for a while, he snuck his way into Warsaw and got to reunite with his family after three years of hell. His work was not over, however, and he drew up many, many plans to liberate Auschwitz, but the home army never allocated the resources. They thought they possibly could take it, but it would just immediately be crushed by German reinforcements, so it wasn't worth it. But that was his life goal, and he, he kept dedicating himself towards them. From there, he joined the Kedda, which was your very stereotypical resistance organization. You know, think blowing up train lines and ammunition depots, assassinating high-ranking Nazis, that kind of stuff. And so he did that for a while. He then took part in the glorious Warsaw Uprising. He originally enlisted just as an ordinary foot soldier, but many high-ranking officers had been killed during the initial days of the Warsaw Uprising, so he eventually took control of his own unit. He took control of the first Warsawananka company, and he was in charge of protecting downtown Warsaw. During the Warsaw Uprising, he reportedly fought very valiantly and risked his life many times to save his comrades. The Warsaw Uprising is so incredibly interesting, and it deserves its own video. But in short, on the 1st of August 1944, the Home Army of Poland, so the Underground Resistance of Poland, launches its all-out uprising against the Nazis. So the plan was the Soviet Union and its troops are right on Warsaw's doorstep. So they're gonna rise up now, overthrow the Germans, then the Soviet army is going to help push back the Germans, and then the home army can establish a independent, non-communist, non-Nazi occupied Poland. This did not end up happening. So the initial uprising takes place and they had been stockpiling ammunition and guns for years at this point. The Warsaw Uprising takes place, you know, thousands of resistance members are uprising through the streets trying to, you know, destroy as many Germans as possible. And the Soviet army has every opportunity to cross the river into Warsaw and help fight off the Germans. But instead, they hold their positions outside of Warsaw and let the Germans come in and destroy the Polish home army. So then the Soviets take advantage of a severely weakened Germany and a severely weakened Poland and just take over everything. This, this is known as, oh my God, it, it makes me angry just talking about it. This is known as the Great Betrayal or the Western Betrayal because the West didn't do anything about this. They just let the Soviets take over Poland. So eventually the, the uprising was crushed after 63 days. The Soviets just sweep in and take everything, and the Western allies do nothing about it. In the Warsaw Uprising, 80 to 90% of Warsaw was rubble by the end of it. On October 8th, 1944, Pilecki was captured by the Germans, and he was taken to a prisoner of war camp, which is not a concentration camp. It's important to mention that, but it's not exactly a pleasant state either. He was interned at Offlag 7, a Murnau. Essentially, it was a camp for Polish high-ranking officers and eventually is liberated by the Americans on the 29th of April, 1945. In Offlag 7, he earned the nickname Daddy, uh, not in a weird way, but because he was the most experienced and like he had seen the most and often helped out the younger prisoners. After he was liberated from the prisoner of war camp, he didn't skip a beat and immediately went straight to Italy where he joined up with the Polish armed forces in exile. And there he compiled all of his reports and he detailed his experiences in the resistance in Auschwitz and the resistance uh, outside of Auschwitz, compiled it all into something called Witold's Report. He joined the Polish Second Corps led by Władysław Anders. Now at this point, Pilecki could have very easily moved his family out of Poland and moved to the West and lived his life, the rest of his life, peacefully and as a war hero, because he sure was one. But he chose not to, and he chose to stay behind in Poland and continue the anti-communist resistance. Polecki chose to not flee Poland because, quote, I will stay. All cannot leave. 
Someone must remain regardless of the consequences. Pilecki revived his old network of Auschwitz informants, and specifically he got the phone numbers of many Polish traitors and communist officials. He even got documents that proved that the People's Referendum, that was essentially the communists, the, the Soviets wanted to establish a, a communist regime in Poland, so they had a vote that was basically saying, uh, do you want this communist regime in Poland, where all the people would vote? And he had documents that proved that it was completely falsified, which it was. It was not a real referendum, it was rigged. He was known as a cursed soldier, which essentially were people who were still loyal to the original Polish government and didn't want the communist government. The cursed soldiers are incredibly interesting in their own right and definitely deserve their own video. The NKVD began to really crack down on these cursed soldiers. Eventually, May 8th, 1947, exactly two years after Germany was defeated in World War II, he was arrested by communists. When he was arrested, he completely owned up to everything he did. He owned up to being an anti-communist, he owned up to using false identities, he, he owned up to gun running, he owned up to not registering himself with the communist government, he owned up for having illegal guns. He just was like, yeah, I did it. He wasn't trying to hide it, because he knew it was, if it was to go to trial, it would just be a foregone conclusion he was going to get executed. He was mercilessly beaten in Mokhtau prison in Warsaw. In Mokhtau prison, uh, he had his fingernails pulled off, he had his legs crushed, he was ruthlessly beaten into a confession. Although forever he maintained that he did not try to assassinate Polish communist government officials like the chief of police. He had his ribs and nose broken as well. His show trial began March 3rd, 1948, and he was found guilty, probably because he wasn't allowed any witnesses and was not allowed to testify. Vladislav Anders published Witold's report as a way to raise awareness for this unjust situation, but it did not end up creating enough of a stir to change the final verdict. Unfortunately, however, Witold's report, like so many of other things about Witold, fell on deaf ears. When Pilecki was being beaten into a confession, he just signed all the documents. He didn't even bother reading them because, you know, it was it's not going to change anything. Interestingly enough, Pilecki believed that treatment from the communists was way worse than treatment from the Nazis. Quote, Compared with them, Auschwitz was just a trifle. He said this to his wife while he was in prison. On March 15th, 1948, he was sentenced to death for being a spy. His execution was fast-tracked so that he could be made an example. He was executed May 25th, 1948, by a gunshot wound to the back of the head in Mokhtau prison at 9.25 p.m. His last words were, I've been trying to live my life so that in the hour of my death, I would feel joy rather than fear. Pilecki was a veteran of World War I, World War II, the Polish-Soviet War, the Polish-Lithuanian War. He volunteered to go to Auschwitz, started multiple resistance organizations. He was a home army officer, Warsaw Uprising veteran, Polish Second Corps officer, veteran of POW camp Landsdorf and Murnau, and a cursed soldier. His family was never told that he died, and they assumed for many, many years after his death that he was just in Siberia somewhere. Clarity only came when a Mokhtau prison guard came to Andrzej Pilecki and told him what happened. Quote, I was in prison with your father. I want to help you because your father was a saint. Under his influence, I changed my life. I did not harm anyone anymore. Pilecki's family obviously suffered greatly under communism. They found it difficult to get a real education or gain a meaningful job. His burial place is still unknown, and it's just assumed that he is in a mass grave with other Polish political prisoners of the era. However, in some good news, after the fall of communism, he was exonerated, and his image has been restored in Poland. He was also promoted to colonel, and he was given the Order of Polonia Restituta and the Order of the White Eagle. Jack Fairweather wrote a book on him, and that's where I get a lot of my information from. Pilecki's son and daughter often honor their father by holding candles outside of Mokotel prison on the day he was executed. Pilecki also has many, many places named after him now. Pilecki was one of the most incredible people I've ever read about. The fact that he gave his spot up to someone else to escape Auschwitz and chose not to 
and that is just a footnote in his life is just it, it's just beyond me it's just unbelievable and the fact that he's not really well known out of outside of poland and i don't even know if he's very well known within poland it, it should be a crime the fact that there isn't you know a triple a blockbuster movie about this guy is awful and that needs to happen like chris evans needs to play this dude but yeah no he is like probably one of the most flawless people i've ever read about i mean with everyone you can find something that they did wrong but for Poletsky, i haven't found anything really you know he just seems like a really well-liked person like he was a cavalryman he was a fun boy and he you know he was people liked him but yeah and and, and he was stoic he was a family man as well like that's it's fucking impressive not to mention he was, he was a fighter for the vast or maybe maybe not the majority of his life but a very significant portion of his life i think that's it's absolutely incredible and something to and something really inspirational there's definitely going to be videos about the cursed soldiers and the warsaw uprising because they're both super interesting but i think that's it i've been rex astoria and i'm out peace